Good morning. I am so glad to see you this morning. I hope that you've had a, a, a wonderful weekend as we move fo- uh, forward in celebrating uh, the 4th of July. Just a few announcements for you. Um, let me start off by reminding you what's going to happen next Sunday. Next Sunday, we get to hear from our, our missionaries from the WMU who went down to Birmingham, Alabama, and the, the trip and the journey that they took there. It's going to be a special day. You've, uh, uh, so I want to invite you to be a part of it. We're going to have lunch afterwards. Is that right? Downstairs in the fellowship hall. And some people are preparing that for you. So just come and, and be a part of what next Sunday means to us. Um, uh, this is the beginning of July, and of course we have a brand new Operation Christmas Child Focus. Uh, don't forget that um, today, or excuse me, we start collecting uh, notepads, coloring books, and um, one more thing that was mentioned in the bullets. And so make sure you, you read your bullets and so you're aware of what the month's focus is on that. This month, we have two big events that I want everybody to, to be aware of and be a part of. The first one is, is that our students are traveling to camp. Um, and I believe those are the 11th through the 16th. The dates for that are July the 11th through the 16th. And we've, they've got a full crowd going, a full house going. And so can we start now praying for our students? Let me tell you what happened. They're going to Fort Caswell uh, for the camp down there. And this week at Fort Caswell, one of our sister churches baptized 18. Um, right here in Harnett County. Um, over at Neal's Creek. Um, and so we're, we, we're excited about that for this past week. But can you, can you join with me in prayer for the students that are going to be there the week that our kids are there? That they have a spiritual revival, a reformation while they're there and God does something in their lives. But on June, and excuse me, also in July on the 24th through the 28th, we have Vacation Bible School right here. And if you haven't agreed to help out with Vacation Bible School, today's the day to turn that around. Uh, Miss Amanda's upstairs right now, so um, uh, you can chat with her. Uh, you know, give her a call after Children's Church is over. But, but Vacation Bible School is where you want to be helping out. I'm so excited about Vacation Bible School this year. It is our church's biggest opportunity to reach out into our community around us. Okay, it's the one where we have several, several, several kids that gather with us through the weeks. So I want to encourage you to be here and to be a part. I'm also I'm going to brag about my family this morning. Are you ready? Are you ready? I I give give announcements for everything else, but I'm going to take one minute before we get online and say I'm so proud of my family this morning. Um, This morning, Carter led Sunday school. Way to go, bud. Um, And Carter's on a pathway. And uh, I had to be in and out, so I could only listen at the corner of the door for a few minutes. Um, But... I believe God has called every one of us to teach others about who Jesus Christ is. And while Carter did it in a classroom, I'm proud of you, bud. Um, He's going to, you know, as God calls his life, we all have that same calling in our homes, our first mission field, in our neighborhoods, our second mission field, and throughout the world. And and Carter, what are you? You're 18. He just turned 18. You can do it, too. You can do it, too. God bless you guys, and welcome to worship. If you're visiting with us, there's a, a set of cards. They're around. If you need one, I've got, apparently I've got a lot of them, okay? And we just want you to fill these out for a second. There's one that looks like this in the pew rack, and, and, and all we want to do is be able to send you a letter in the mail this week, let you know we've been praying for you, and we can get your name that lets us to pray for you and give you a little information about our congregation, about all the cool things that we're doing, all the worshipful things that we do to gather together in Jesus Christ. So with all of that said, let's continue to move forward in worship today. Good morning. Would you all please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of our country? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Now, if you'll join me in the place of the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the flag of the Christian flag. One brotherhood, united in our traditions, in service and in love. 
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you as the first one to give us freedom and independence. Jesus is dying on the cross to save us from our sins, to give us his freedom. Dear Lord, we thank you for all the ones in the past who have sacrificed themselves, to put their lives on the line, to give us our freedom and independence that we will celebrate tomorrow. Dear Lord, it's been 246 years since that signing. Dear Lord, we thank you for blessing all those who have given their lives throughout time to help, our, help us and others to have freedom and independence. We thank you for blessing those who have served and are still serving and that you will keep them in your arms and protect them. And we thank you again for all that you have done for us in all times. For we know that everything we have belongs to you. And there is no other but you. Dear Lord, in all these things, we give you all the thanks and the praise and the glory, Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, I declare, God, we just thank you for your son, Jesus. Unreal what this country has done to what you did for us when we first started this country. You formed the best country on earth. The people have tried to tear it apart. Jesus, thank you for all the blessings you give us every day, being in our hearts, us that know you. Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving us a Savior. Thank you for letting Jesus come and die on the cross for our sins. And Lord, look at what our politicians have done to our country now that you established Lord, help us, help us to straighten this mess out. We love you, Lord, and we just pray for our country. In Jesus Christ's name, you gotta, we got to support our churches because this is the only way out. We've got to get our churches to bring this country back up, and we've got to support our churches. We've got to give our portion to support the church. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Aren't we fortunate to have Ms. Tracy as a part of our congregation uh, to be here to lead us in worship today? Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I, I've called uh, Tracy Kathy. Uh, Tanya is now Tracy. We're so thankful, of course, to have Tanya. Um, and our fellowship together. We're going to start off this morning by praying for Linda Loso uh, for our sermon time. If you remember, Linda uh, just went through cancer surgery. Um, she is uh, got a very positive report from that, but now has to move forward through that. And, and our quilt ministry has made her this quilt uh, to bless her with, but we bless her as a church family by continuing to remember her in prayer. But if you remember, just a couple of weeks ago, maybe 40 weeks ago, we had a quilt also for her husband, Paul, because they're both struggling with cancer right now. So would you join me with a commitment? You're going to pray for them for the next several days, but also right now. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the fellowship with the Losos and with Paul and Linda. Today we're especially mindful of Linda. We pray for her healing. Pray that you would continue to keep the cancer far away from her father and be with her through the future procedures that she has in this area. Father, bless her and with every good thing from heaven above. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, wow. Um, so if you have your Bibles, we're going to start a brand new sermon series today that's going to take us forward into the future. Next week, we're going to be hearing from, of course, our Alabama missionaries. Uh, and then in the following weeks, we'll also be hearing from our students and their return back. So it's going to take us a little while to, to move through um, 2 Corinthians chapter 20. So if you have your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 20, and we're going to start looking at a character whose name is Jehoshaphat. Are you ready? Are you ready, brothers and sisters? Okay, so say Jehoshaphat with me. It's a fun name to say. 
It's not one we use that often anymore, but Jehoshaphat, say it with me, Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat. Um, it's a, just a great name to say. So we're going to start looking at Jehoshaphat uh, and his life through the uh, Chronicles of, excuse me, Second Chronicles chapter 20. And while we're going through that, while we're going through that, today, of course, we celebrate uh, Fourth of July. And um, have you noticed that we have a few phrases for this weekend? Okay. Like I, like I just left out the. Like we call it 4th of July instead of the 4th of July. Or you might call it the 4th of July and I just call it 4th of July. Some of you might not even use that term. You might call it Independence Day. Are you with me? You might call it Independence Day. So we have a few different names, but what we celebrate is the founding of our nation. Okay? And, and I believe, I'm a firm believer, that we live in the best nation on planet Earth. But that means that we live in a unique way that nobody else lives on planet Earth, just like the United States of America lives. I believe absolutely that we were founded by God for a reason. And I want to continue that reason. Our nation uh, started off on rebellion. You know, it's odd that I don't want my children to rebel against me. But we celebrate rebellion as a way because we were living under tyranny. Uh, the The ideas of another nation telling us how we should live all the way across the ocean from here. And so we rebelled against that tyranny. Now, that is a, a freedom or a, a fight for freedom that, that we celebrate and that we established as, a, as an American nation here. Okay, But there was a fight for freedom that's been going on long before that. And it's still going on today. And while I really am thankful to live in the best nation in the world, we are here to celebrate. We are, brothers and guys, we are here to celebrate that Jesus gave us an everlasting freedom. Free, freedom from the, the consequences of sin, which is death. Separation from God. He gave us the prize of freedom, which is eternity with Him in heaven in a life fulfilled here on planet earth. I believe that he is totally worth all of our worship, all of our praise today. Back in on March the 3rd of 1776, there was a debate in the Virginia um, House of Representatives and Congress, their legislature, about sending troops to join the Revolutionary War. And it was there that Patrick Henry said this. What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of change and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. It's said that in that Virginia legislature room, those gentlemen stood up and started chanting together, give me liberty or give me death. It became a chorus, a revolutionary chorus well, that we celebrate historically today. But did you know that 200 years earlier, there was another revolution going on in Scotland. And a gentleman by the name of John Knox uh, had been praying for the freedom of, of Scotland. Uh, and, and it is said that when John Knox prayed that Mary, Queen of Scots, trembled. And that his prayers brought forth the freedom for the Scotland nation. And, and it, excuse me, John Knox said, you know, during that times, I know not if God had placed, ever placed a more godly, excuse me, John Knox said, I read the wrong portion, nothing more dangerous, there's nothing more dangerous in, in this world to, than to be freed from the spiritual bondage and tyranny that are, excuse me, that are left here in front of us. And then he went on to say, give me freedom or give me Scotland. 
And from a similar revolution, the the freedom of Scotland was had. Now, I don't want to talk to you about political freedom because I have a firm belief that politics are not going to save us. Jesus Christ is. He is our Savior. And we want to align all of our hearts and lives with who He is and with what He's done. I'm not looking for anything else. And so I want to place a heavy burden on you. Okay? If I believe that, if I believe what I just said, that I believe that we, His people, the church, are charged to bring revolution to those that are around us. Now, when I say revolution, I'm trying to use some specific words because we're currently living in a culture that is not turning towards God, but away from Him. And would you help me start a revolution to turn our families, let's start with our first mission field, our families back to Jesus Christ. I hope that you feel the call and the motivation today to start not just with your family, but with your neighborhood. Because if your neighborhood, if you knew that your neighborhood was under tyranny, wouldn't you fight for their freedom? So let's fight for their spiritual freedom today. And not just, not just our neighborhoods, the neighborhood that I get to live in, the neighborhood that you get to live in. Would you commit and feel the motivation to rise up? To rise up. And not just fight, not just fight spiritually for your families and for your neighborhoods, but also for our nation. I believe that within each of you is the power to bring revival to those that are around you because you have within you the same Holy Spirit that we all have. Give us America today. Maybe that should be our prayer. Give us, maybe it needs to start for you though, give me my family today or give me death. It was was not uh, unheard of what John Knox did. It was not unheard of what Patrick Henry did. So it would not be a far-fetched thing for you to go, give me my neighborhood or give me death. Give me, give me Lillington, brothers and sisters, or give me death. It's not radical if you knew they were living under tyranny. So please stand with me. As we read these first four chapters of Second Chronicles chapter 20. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, excuse me, and Ammonites with some of the Minyanites came together to make war on Jehoshaphat. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the sea. It is already in Hazazan Tamar, that is in Gadi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. And the people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word in our lives and in our families. Please, please be seated. Um, so, Uh, Of course, a few mindsets. Yes, we're talking about freedom. And Jehoshaphat is actually one of the perfect characters to bring this conversation in over the next several weeks. We're talking about the blessing and responsibility of of freedom. And hopefully that you would be motivated. I know, you you know, uh, it, it is a heavy burden to carry. Yes, it is. But that you would feel motivated, feel inspired, revived even by the Holy Spirit to be the change that our world needs. Because if you're not willing, if you're not hearing the call, if you're not invigorated, then how can we expect anybody else that is not a Christ follower to do that? And so Jehoshaphat's a unique character in Scripture. Jehoshaphat starts off as a priest. He starts off as a priest, uh, a leader of God's people in the, in the house of worship, in the temple. He goes from being a priest to also being a recorder um, for King David and King Solomon. But, but after Solomon now, he goes from being priest, recorder, to being the king of Judah. After Solomon, the nation of Israel divides into Israel and Judah. Uh, and he becomes the king of Judah. The name Jehoshaphat refers to 
uh, being a person of administration or judgment. And so Judah has this care, excuse me, Judah, Jehoshaphat has this character of being a judge or being um, uh, an administrator. And, and he is well respected in the land that he lives in, not just in Judah, not just in Israel, but also in the surrounding territories. Um, he has some accolades already coming. Now, he's not a perfect king, and he does some things that are ungodly along the way, but he also strives for God all along the way. Um, some of the, the things that he does is that he brings this civil rebellion between Israel and Judah uh, to peace during his reign. Um, and so he, he establishes some peace between King Ahab of Israel and Judah. Uh, also, the surrounding nations uh, really respect him because he has a strong and powerful army. Right? One of the other things that he does, this is at the top of my list for, for the claims of fame for King Jehoshaphat. King Jehoshaphat removed all of the Asherah poles. Now, you, you may not know what Asherah poles are. Uh, they were in the temple. They were in the community of, of Jerusalem and throughout the nation. Asherah poles were these poles and, 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 and statues used to worship the god Asheram. Um, and Asheram was a goddess of fertility. And so when, when I, I say that he removed those poles, he also went through the process of removing the worship of Asherah. And, and I, um, if you can't imagine a fertility God and the things done to worship a fertility God. And they're humanistic, they're, they're sensual, they're something that I would be embarrassed to talk about. And he removes that worship from the nation of Israel. So, so let's, let's just get a clue to who Jehoshaphat is and what he's done. And you can go back, start reading around chapter 17, 18, and 19, all the way to where we're at right now. Jehoshaphat brings political freedom, national freedom to the people of Israel. Okay, are you with me? But he also brings a spiritual liberation. For Jehoshaphat, who is a priest and a king, they are not two separate things. He puts them together and God uses the reign of Jehoshaphat to bring, yes, political and national stability and freedom. But he also uses him to bring spiritual freedom. And by the time we come to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, they are enjoying some of that peace and some of that freedom. But 2 Corinthians chapter 20 also answers a simple question. Guys, what happens when your freedom is tested? You know, you've achieved something, you've been giving something, you've established something. So what happens when that becomes tested? Jehoshaphat, of course, mighty king, vast army. Give me set up some of these things and they have some measure to celebrate. Because when we get freedom, don't we want to rest in our freedom a little bit? Because we think freedom means I can do whatever I want to do. And generally what I want to do is sit down and take it easy. Amen? I mean, I, I just, I'll be honest with you. But generally what I want to do is have a life of comfort. That's what freedom means for us today. But, but I believe today, number one, give you three points through this section. Number one, freedom has to be maintained. It cannot be left alone. It does not happen by itself. Freedom has to be maintained through exercise. Freedom has to be maintained. So let's look at that from uh, this passage's perspective. After this, after this civil freedom and peace came between Judah and Israel, after uh, the, 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 the national and, and, and ge geographical notoriety that Israel and Judah now have and how people respect them, after that, you would expect them to have some peace, but that does not happen. The Moabites and the Ammonites start to wage war against Israel. Now, I'll give you a little historical context to tell you that these people that it mentions, uh, the Ammonites, the, the Minyanites, uh, uh, the, the, excuse me, the Moabites, were the original um, uh, inhabitants of the land that they were living in. And, and so, the, if you remember, the people of Israel came in and claimed a land that was not theirs. Who told them to? So if God tells you to do something, you do it. Now we would say in today's political climate in this world, and you may agree with me in some way, 
that since they are the original inhabitants of that land, shouldn't they de- don't they deserve some respect? Since they are the original inhabitants of that land, don't they deserve some consideration? Shouldn't the Ammonites, uh, the Moabites, the Minyanites, don't they deserve some consideration? But there's probably a better question than that for this. Because in today's political climate, we like to argue about who gets what consideration. I want you to understand, I want to give everybody respect and consideration. But Jesus Christ did something. He, 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 he died on a cross and He rose again. He did something for a reason. He invaded territory for a reason. The territory of our hearts. Just like Israel invaded this land and took it away. Because there is a freedom and, and, uh, and fulfillment that only God, that only Jesus Christ brings. And people would be better living underneath His authority. Now, I know that that may not sound politically correct and it may not go really well in our hearts, but I have this firm belief, this this deep down in my soul, that everything on planet Earth would be better if we realized that the freedom Jesus gave us wasn't for us to do what we want to do, but because He knew that we were under the freedom, uh, excuse me, under the tyranny of sin, and we are free to be under the rule of the kingdom of God. And I know that's huge because you want to do whatever you want to do. Because, and whatever we want to do eventually means that I don't have to do anything to maintain the freedom that I have. That's what it eventually means. Because I, because I want to be able to be comfortable and be easy, it eventually means I do nothing. And I believe without a, all of my heart that the freedom Christ gave you I'm just talking about spiritual revolution. Guys, my children, listen to me. The freedom that Jesus Christ gave you was so that you could follow Him. Be underneath His authority. Because it's there that we thrive. So I believe that every nation, every nation living in the time of Jehoshaphat, every group of people, the Ammonites, the Moabites, everybody living in this period of time, would it be better underneath the authority and rule of God? So what does was Jehoshaphat do? Jehu, the seer, the, excuse me, um, some people in verse 2, some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming. What does Jehoshaphat do? From Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is, uh, it is already in Hezazan Tamar. Jehoshaphat gets word that there's coming a sneak attack. Now, if you're looking at the map of Israel, Dead Sea's at the bottom. They're coming up through Edom area. They're coming around the long way to try to sneak them from behind. But, but he gets word of what's going on. And so, uh, again, I'm just tracking a little bit further. In verse 3, alarmed. Jehoshaphat. Uh, and uh, literally, Jehoshaphat was afraid. Uh, and if we ever get stuck in fear, let me just give you a few fear comments, if I may. Number one, number one, fear can paralyze our growth in Jesus Christ. It convinces us, number two, that the bully is stronger than our faith. And that bully may be a situation that you're encountering. That bully may be the devil himself. That bully may be a crisis. You've got a bully sometimes. And that bully causes fear. And that bully convinces you that it's more powerful than God is in your life. And so we become afraid. And that fear can sometimes paralyze us. What do we do? I'm terrified. We start to feel like we're in quicksand. We start sinking further and further down. Or we can respond like Jehoshaphat. How does Jehoshaphat respond with his fear? Now, not in spite of. Please understand. I didn't say that he cast fear aside. I didn't say he mustered up all of his bravery and courage. How did he respond in, in his fear? 
alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. Can you, if you're a Bible writer, I would underline that and circle it and, and maybe make it, you know, your motto for the next year. That no matter what you face, no matter the crises, no matter how big, no matter how small, we commit to inquire of the Lord. If we're stuck in fear, we're going to commit to inquire of the Lord. It doesn't matter what we face. We're going to inquire of the Lord because I believe two humble things. Number one, Jesus Christ gave us all the freedom that we have, just as God secured through Jehoshaphat all the freedom that they had. And so if I believe that God is the author of my freedom, then when my freedoms or my ability to exercise that freedom starts to become questioned, what do I do? Even when I'm afraid, I go back to the one who guaranteed me that freedom. And notice this again, this is it's an odd thing, guys. It's an odd thing in the world that we live in. Because you would expect me to say, well, stand up, it's time to rebel. People are acting, you know, un ungodly towards God. You'd expect me to say, you've got to, you've got to give them what for? You know what I mean? You would know what I say is, it's time for us to inquire of the Lord. He's the one that guaranteed us, that created it that gave it away. He's the one who is the author of freedom. And if we're struggling in our freedom today, it's time that we inquire of the Lord. And notice, I really appreciate the, the nation of Israel's response and Jehoshaphat's response here. Okay? Because what he did not do was erect the Asherah poles back up. You with me? He didn't in his fear go back and say, well, what we're doing is not working. Let's go put some poles up and start worshiping a pagan fertility goddess. Instead, he doubled down. Instead, he got um, even stronger in his urgent uh, inquiry of the Lord. Instead of abandoning, he embraced. Because our freedom, whether it be spiritual or any other kind, has got to be maintained. And when I say maintained, let me tell you, the devil himself trembles. And this whole world will shake when a believer starts inquiring of the Lord and seeking what he may find. So they elect a fast. But I want, to, I want to be really honest with you. What you do next is important. What we walk out of here with in the next few minutes is going to be important. I'm praying that you guys will be revived, that I will be revived. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will get a hold of us. I'm praying that we will rise up today. Because our family members need Jesus Christ. Because there's a mission for all people to come underneath the comprehensive rule and authority of God as secured by the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ. And it's real and it's needed today more than ever, and we cannot rest about it. We can't give up. We, we, we can't get comfortable in our seats. We can't do that. Something unique happened about 10 days, and I've only said one thing about it. This is the second thing I'm going to say about it. And I don't know how you feel about it. I'm going to tell you exactly how I feel about it. Okay, about 10 days ago, the, the ruling for Roe versus Wade changed forever. Now, I, I am unapologetically pro-life. I believe that, that life was created, uh, excuse me, life is created by God, so He's the only one who de should determine how it goes. And it doesn't, just re re excuse me, it doesn't just refer to what happens in a womb, it also refers to what happens at the end of our life. I believe in the sanctity of life all the way around. And I, and, and I, I don't know how you fall on this, I believe it happens at conception. I believe that Genesis is clear about that. I believe that we read that throughout the Scripture. I believe that God is clear on this matter. We're the ones struggling with it. And I, and I, I rejoice. I do. I do rejoice that there was a ruling that the federal government in some way would overturn what happened at Roe versus Wade. We've been living underneath that tyranny for almost, what, 60 years? 50 plus years? Now, I don't know how you feel about this, but I also mourn. I have a sense of grief. 
have a sense of grief, number one, because there are other people who view this as the taking away of their rights. I, I, I mourn. I grieve because there are other people who are stirring up fear and stirring up anger and hate. I mourn. Number three, in grief, because no matter what, no matter what, this involves somebody. Somebody loved by God. Somebody that God sent His Son to die for and He sent Him to rise again for and to give all of us freedom from that tyranny. But do you know what? That same freedom we have to maintain today. That means that it would behoove us, me, and you, behoove me as a believer in Jesus Christ because I believe so strongly that God has done something that I want to go to somebody and share with them the good work of Jesus Christ and minister to them. That means that the mission field for the hurting is going to be easy to see right now. That means don't stoke the fires of tyranny. But instead, stoke the fires and flames of freedom in Jesus Christ. That behooves us as a church now, not just Lillington Baptist Church, but the greater church to respond with grace and mercy and minister to the hurting. Because freedom has to be maintained. Because if we just let it sit, it goes away. And we work hard for it and share it. It becomes precious and valuable. Jehoshaphat starts a national prayer. Now, you might not be able to start a national prayer. This is the first national prayer recorded in all of the uh, scriptures. Jehoshaphat starts it. You might not start a national prayer, but you could start your own prayer. Dear Lord, help me to spread the freedom that you've given me. Or, dear Lord, I'm the one under tyranny. My spirit is pent down. I feel broken. You promised freedom. Daniel's telling me you promised freedom. Bring me freedom. Bring me freedom from the sins that so easily hold us down. From addiction. From lust. From hate. From gossip. From division. Bring us freedom. But then you're also charged to be an agent of that freedom. Notice we're going to actually end on, excuse me, on verse 4. The people, the entire people of Judah came together. What did they come together for? They're going to have a little revival. Spiritual reformation. And maybe that's what you need today. Don't be fooled. Listen, brothers and sisters, if you're living underneath the tyranny of freedom, there's only one person that can bring us freedom, and that's Jesus Christ. Acts, what is it, chapter 4, brother? Acts chapter 4. There is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved except for Jesus Christ. That, that, so I, I'm, I'm a really, I'm a literal reader. I think that refers to all freedom. All liberty. The freedom that I have was wrought by Christ. And I realize that everybody else is living underneath tyranny if they don't have Him. That's what I want to share. Jehoshaphat and the entire nation of Israel gather to inquire of the Lord, to seek His help. Indeed, they came not, not from some towns, but from every town in Judah to seek. Now, we're going to pause there because we're going to wait on a cliff um, uh, for till next week or the week after because all he wanted to hear was one word from the Lord. What should they do? How should they respond? One word from the Lord granted him freedom to be able to move forward. One word of direction and guidance. One word today in our lives, me and you, as we inquire of the Lord. What would that do to us? One word to turn us around. One word to gain freedom for our family. One word to gain freedom for our neighborhood, for our nation. One word. And that word is Jesus Christ. There was a little boy who was playing in a sandbox. Now I'll tell you ahead of time, the sandbox is a metaphor for your family and your life. 
Okay? And sometimes we play in our sandboxes, don't we? Little boy's playing in the sandbox, and he finds a giant truck. You remember those big orange Tonka trucks or yellow Tonka trucks? They were the coolest things in the world, and he found one buried, but this little boy started digging it out and digging it out, but it was full of sand, and he had trouble digging it out and then pushing it to the side. It was so heavy for him, he could not lift it over, and he gets frustrated and angry. And he's looking down there and saying, as we would at my house, stupid truck. I dug you out, but you can't get out, truck. Now, I make fun of it, but we do the same thing when we come to difficulties in our sandboxes, don't we? Little boy goes crying to his dad, frustrated, angry. Dad, of course, why are you so angry? Why are you so frustrated? I tried everything I could do to get that truck out, but it's just too hard. Dad looked at the son and said, you didn't try everything. You didn't come and ask me. Nothing more powerful today than the people of God figuring out. We can come to our Heavenly Father. No matter the circumstances, we're not looking to, to, for national freedom, just like Jehoshaphat. We're not looking for their pol political figures. What did they do? They inquired of the Lord. We commit to God's people. We want to come before Him because we know He has the freedom that we all need. We know the revival that He can bring into our lives and into those around us. And I pray today it starts with you. Pray today it starts with you. Heavenly Father, we just inquire of You. We ask. Father, some of us ask deep, deep questions of heartache and Pain and but Father, we also just ask you to show up right now to convict us of being complacent in our freedom, in our spirits. Instead, Father, that you would stir us up. Stir us up. To embrace this world with the same type of love that Christ has. Call us today, Father, to be on mission in your name. As we seek you. And I pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Please stand with me. Some of you have been at war yourself. And you're fighting against the sin. I invite you to come forward. And lay that before the cross. Call on his name. Because he's the only one that brings freedom. Some of us need to commit. To joining God's mission. To being on mission with those around us. Because we can't give up on that either. Or we get complacent. And it falls away. You decide today. Follow the Jesus Christ. Thank you, Miss Tracy. It's been such a privilege to be with you today. Dang, I did it twice. Tanya. And it was only funnier because Shirley laughed so loud at me. I'll leave us now with, with one small note. Um, there was a book written by a guy named Bevan Alexander about the life of Hannibal. If you remember, Hannibal uh, was a great military genius and, and fought, but he fought mainly on top of elephants. Do you remember that? And would conquer people from these elephants because they were a position of power and most of the armies of his time didn't have those. Until, until, until a, gentleman, a general by the name of Sapicio Africanus stood up to him. And found that the elephants could not fight as fast and as quick as his men on, his, uh, on their ma machinery. Now, I'll tell you this because we're always looking for somebody else to do something. We feel like the world is too dark. Until. The bully's too big. Until. Until that general or until you today stand forward. I charge you today to go and spread the same freedom that you've been given. Stand up for it. Stand in it. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now, Matthew, if you would, as the church, we will love as Jesus has loved us. Serve wherever we go and share his good news with the world around us.